What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. It's your man's Nicholas. As always, big dogs gotta eat fantasy football. It is Monday, so we are doing another episode of Behind the Scenes of the fantasy football industry. I am joined by a very, very, very special guest. I know you guys are gonna be very excited for this one. This is Jason Moore of the Fantasy Footballers. Um, I probably don't need to give too much of an introduction, but he is uh, one of the trio of guys that make up the Fantasy Footballers who are probably the quickest growing brand in the industry. Very successful, a uh, huge year in 2018, which we'll dive into and, and break down all of the different aspects of their brand and what makes them so special and what makes them so unique. Um, so without further ado, Jason, welcome to the channel. Thank you for coming on, man. I'm uh, I'm super excited for the talk. Yeah, yeah, happy to be here. I always love the opportunity to talk not just about like analysis and what player, but uh, more behind the scenes and the, the business side of things that I know over here. I know you, you had Andy on once and uh, that's the type of stuff we we're really passionate about. We We love that stuff. Yeah, yeah, me too. That's something that um, that's always intrigued me a little bit more than the whole fantasy football thing. And it's interesting that, you know, you guys have been able to build a massive platform. And then um, it seems like you guys are kind of using that platform to go into other topics and aspects uh, of your interests. And, and we'll get there in a second. But I want to first say congrats for the uh, iHeartRadio Podcast Award. That was incredible. For any of you guys that aren't familiar, the iHeartRadio Podcast Awards last week or two weeks ago maybe in LA and the Fantasy Footballers brought home the best sports podcast award of the year of 2018. And there were some heavy hitters in that category. Um, there was, you know, Colin Coward, Bill Simmons, ESPN's 30 for 30, uh, the Barstool Podcast. First of all, how much uh, of a shock was that for you to have won that uh, award? Uh, yeah. you know, it was, it was, it was a roller coaster of, I was sure we were going to win. Then I was not sure. Then we won. And you know, the, the thing is, is that award was user vote. It was, you know, the, the, the audience participation, people that are listening, they go online, they vote. And so far the foot clan, the foot clan's undefeated. We, I mean, if there's a user vote, I know we're taking it get down because the, the audience that we have, you know, luckily assembled is just unbelievable and they're so you know they're activated they're part of our brand you know it's not just like they listen to us it's they're a part of us and so i you know as far as was i surprised to win it, it was a funny little story when we got there it's this really big production you know red carpet affair and there's some you know scattered with uh, little celebrities out here and there and and then we get brought to our seats and our seats are right next to the stage fancy table the hors d'oeuvres and i'm like oh we won like <laughs> you get sat right you don't sit us right by the stage unless we're gonna win so we're all excited and then the fox guys show up representing colin cowherd and then espn shows up and then you know everybody comes to that table and it's like oh yeah <laughs> this is just the sports table so uh, only one you know group from this table will win that's when i started going ah uh, you know it, it was it was the fact that i thought we were gonna win that made me think, oh, we're going to lose. And I remember looking at the list, and uh, my first thought was that I was looking for a sports book that actually had the odds for your category to see if I could throw money down on you guys, um, as well as Barstool, because I think uh, you guys and Barstool have that that um, you know that brand loyalty and that audience connection. And I, you know, I was going to ask you not only like how surprised were you, but the reason you guys won, in my opinion, of course, is because of your connection with the fans, because it was a fan vote. So you're looking at this and, you know, Colin Cowherd and Bill Simmons, whatever, they've been doing their thing for a while and they're very well respected in their industry and at their crafts and whatnot. But I don't think the audience connection is there with those guys, right? There's some, there's someone you kind of turn on the, the podcast or turn on TV, you see them and you don't have that intensive itch to go on and, and vote. And I'd be vote anytime you guys tweeted something out, I'd be like going on and voting like, yeah, let me cast my, my five votes or whatever. So that brand loyalty is, is so, so strong. And it's crazy because you guys are in such a, a small niche, fantasy football, right? And you're taking on these other brands and these other companies that um, encompass all of, of the sports. So I kind of want to get your, your take on how big of an impact on on the fantasy football industry itself do you think you guys having the award or winning the award made? Because I'm sure I had the mindset that it was going to come down to either you or Barcelona for for that reason. But most people probably you know wouldn't have had you guys in, in the top two. I want to hear your point of view on um, like how big this was for the industry, and it, it kind of I, I think it put it on a platform, you know. 
Yeah, well, a lot of people don't realize. So if you're in, you know, look, people watching this show, they are into the fantasy sports industry. And when you're in that, you realize how big podcasting is, how many people are podcasting, how large some of the, the bigger podcasters are. And so you get it, but no one else gets it. Like nobody else. The fantasy sports are like the redheaded stepchild of podcasting. <laughs> we go to podcast movement and, you know, we're just it's, it's one of those things where you're not really taken serious because not only is it not a highly produced, edited, long-form interview type of thing that is currently synonymous with podcasting, but then it's a niche of a niche. It's like, oh, it's, right. it's just sports, but you're not just sports. You're just fantasy football. Um, so I think it was big. I think it was really neat for the fantasy industry to say, we are as important to sports as the sports themselves um, and so, yeah, I, I think it was. I think it was very big. I, I'm, I'm happy we did. I'm proud we did. And, and I agree with you that it was definitely going to be between us and Barstool, because you know, you talk about the brand loyalty. One of the, one of the things that there's just nothing ESPN could ever do to circumvent what, what we have is, is independence, right? Like when you listen to ESPN, even if you love the show, love it, and it's the best show you've ever heard. You don't really think you're part of ESPN. Right. Yeah, they're ESPN. But when you're independent and you find us and we're your secret weapon for taking down your hashtag Foot Clan titles, you are you're a part of the show. You, right. you, our listeners are truly not just like, oh, I feel a part. They are a part of the show. So it's, uh, I, I think that being independent is great, and I think winning it as a fantasy show in the industry is 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 good for the industry itself. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's crazy that you guys ended up winning the award. And, you know, if there was going to be a year where I saw Barstool taking it over you guys, it was this year. And then eventually you guys kind of taking over the show. But now that you took it down this year, <laughs> I kind of imagine that, like, you guys are going to take home this award for, like, five straight years now. You're going to run it for for a long time. I think you kind of have your foot in the door. And it's, uh, you right over there? You good? I'm dying. Swallowed water down the wrong tube. Yeah, you know, that. I hope that's true. Or... Or, or we poked the bear, mm, you know. Could be. Or everyone thought they would win. They didn't have to push hard. Then it's like, oh, we lost to the fantasy guys. Yeah, you guys might be labeled as that. For real though, congratulations. And uh, side question: Who was the the coolest person for you personally to meet at the award show? Man, uh, look, I mean, when you meet AC Slater himself, uh, it's pretty cool. But I think Mike Tyson. I mean, Mike yeah. Tyson was just so cool to meet. He actually. Uh, cut in front of us on the red carpet line because we were near the end and you know his uh, handler came over and was like do you mind if we let Mike Tyson cut and it's like well you don't really say no to Mike Tyson so we got a chance to talk, talk to him before the show mm -hmm. he was uh, he's quite a character I, I'd have to put him number one you guys get one do we get <laughs> one um, wow thank you so much thank you iHeartRadio thank you to all of our amazing listeners uh, thank you to our families that let us run after this absolutely ridiculous dream like four years ago yeah and uh thanks to our amazing producer brooks um our manager damon josh brian kyle all of our team rob you know pretty cool it. foot clan foot clan you are mighty and strong you took that award home for the fantasy football podcast but you guys have also spun off and started a second podcast this year the spitballers podcast what was your reason what was the inspiration why did uh why did you start the spitballers podcast yeah the spitballers is a it, you know it's really it's more of like a passion project than anything it's not a huge business push something that we're really you know putting our weight behind but you know we it, you always have a question like i i grew up doing comedy that's that was my background i spent my summers in uh California doing the groundlings and I you know ran a comedy improv troupe in college where I met my wife and so everything for me was was comedy uh, far before I got into fantasy football and sports and all of that and so you know we're, we have fun on the show we goop around but we try to make sure that we stay on on track people aren't coming to listen to a comedy show they're coming to win their you know their fantasy leagues and so Sometimes we just want to go nuts and talk about nothing and get off the rails and have no rules as to what we have to talk about. And when brushing your teeth, does the toothpaste go on the brush before you add water or after you add water to the brush? I've been searching for this answer forever. Oh, you came to the right place. Yeah, you yeah. certainly did. I mean, this is cut and dry, guys, right? I mean, this is... Oh, there, yeah, there's... A you put the toothpaste, then the water. Hmm. Eh. 
Yeah, that's that's incorrect. That is incorrect. Would you like to take a try? Uh, yeah. The correct answer is you put the toothpaste on the brush and you put the brush in your mouth. There you, is you, no water you're a dry before guy? or after. No, I was not a dry guy. What do you mean no? Well, I guess I am. I am water, toothpaste, toothpaste water. Why do you feel like you need the water before the toothpaste if you're going to water after the toothpaste? <laughs> because well, the water on the on the on the bristles, uh-huh. I feel like helps the uh, helps the toothpaste lay better. <laughs> 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 yes, yes, of you course it seen. does, Mike. So we we started the Spitballers just as this fun, family friendly comedy show, and it's you know it's it's been great. It's been a lot of fun. We it doesn't take a lot of work. It's just flip on the mics, have some silly questions, have fun, and it's been fun. We've been doing it about seven months. Just crossed the one million download mark. Uh, but we still have not made a sense yet. Maybe, maybe we'll monetize it someday. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say the way I looked at it was almost like it's more of an entertainment thing and it's more for your guys' enjoyment. But again, it's it's like a genius move from a branding play because people just get that personality side from you. And you guys already do a great job of that on your regular podcast. So people feel like they know you. And like you said, they're kind of sitting at the table, you know, sitting at the table with you already. And uh, I think that that only helps grow the brand loyalty more because it's probably a lot of the audience, 99% of the audience is just funneled from fantasy footballers into into that audience. If you're starting a brand new podcast for anyone thinking about starting a new podcast, you know, you have a lot of experience from running the fantasy footballers for the last couple of years. What were your biggest like lessons going into the spitballers? Or if you had to restart a podcast without having, I guess, the equipment and stuff that you had with the fantasy footballers, like what were your biggest what were your biggest moves coming from the footballers to the spitballers? Biggest like lessons when you're starting off? Well, I mean, we, we obviously already had the equipment. Changing over, one of the things we wanted to do was cast the widest net possible. That was one lesson, and we wanted evergreen. So those two things are something that's really unfortunate in fantasy sports, right? Nobody is going to turn on right now and listen to week 13 waiver wire shows from 2017. That sucks. It's it's irrelevant content. The nice thing about the, the spitballers or any podcast you're doing, even fantasy football, if you take this approach, is you can go with something that is... Um, you know, more, more strategy, more, more, uh, you know, not time sensitive to where these episodes can accumulate downloads, can be relevant a year, two years later, they can still be helpful or they can still be funny or whatever genre you're getting into. I think casting a wide net is huge. We did that even when we started the fantasy footballers, like not everybody wants to be mainstream, right? Mainstream isn't always the coolest thing. You want to be down in the weeds and give the, you know, all the data in the world and you're, you're seeking out, you know, that, that niche of people that really want to be there. We, we made a choice. We wanted to be for the most common fan of fantasy football. And, and now we said, Oh, the two things we want an even wider net. Cause look, your mother, if she doesn't play fantasy football, she can't listen to the fantasy football. <laughs> you know, it's just, yeah. it's going to be the worst show ever. Uh, but you can listen to the spitballers because, wide net there's nobody in the world that can't listen that can't enjoy it and that was kind of the goal is while we are going to heavily funnel from the fantasy footballers and that's where the audience will start we want it to be able to grow far wider than than our niche audience so i would say keeping it evergreen not not time sensitive it's not we're not talking about topical news um and uh things of the moment and then uh casting the widest widest audience net possible yeah i I think that evergreen content is it's something that's tricky, but I also think it has a double-edged sword for people in our industry, you know, fantasy football, just because when you have a topic that is time-sensitive or it's going to go away, like you said, no one's going to watch last week's episode, that does mean you have to have a lot of discipline and a lot of commitment and dedication to make sure you're on time with those things, which does in itself kind of naturally narrow out a lot of people who aren't willing to uh, put in the work. So I think it kind of works both ways in that sense, but it does kind of stink that most of the stuff we put out is not evergreen content and can't really stay around and it's hard to accumulate. So that's a that's a good point you made with the spitballers. I do think though, like for people starting out, it, it's tough because you need to find your own unique niche, right? You need to find that that spot where you fit and you can't get to somewhere by doing like the same things that other people did to get to that spot. For people who are just starting out, would you say that that starting out with a niche is probably more beneficial to them? I think it's easier to get noticed. And so in that way, it's more beneficial. 
you know, the, the, the prime example that I'm sure gets brought up all the time is Matt Harmon. You know, <laughs> yeah, he, he goes every time. with reception perception. Yep. You know, he, he doesn't just try to do reinvent the wheel. He wants to take a look at one thing. But even then, he's not niche. He's not more niche than fantasy sports, right? Because he's doing his niche within the industry, but it's still mainstream. Every single player playing fantasy sports needs to know about wide receivers. And so, you know, you can you can have your niche and say, this is what's different about me, or this is what my focus, my specialty is, but still keep it for an audience of as many people as you can. And I think Matt Harmon did a great job. That's why we've brought him in, you know, here. He's a big part of uh, what we do with the Ultimate Draft Kit and stuff like that because his content is great. And when you focus – it's a lot easier to have great content than if you're trying to do everything. Yeah, he's always someone that people bring up uh, in terms of, you know, like niching down and finding that one unique thing about you that kind of stands out from the rest. But I think there's a, a million different ways to go about that. I don't think it needs to be a specific statistic or a viewpoint. It could be one of a million things that makes you unique. It could be the entertainment value. It could be a way of uh, of marketing. It could be first to market on a platform. There's a million different ways to be unique and it doesn't come down to being data driven. And it's just about finding what really resonates with you and then putting a twist on it that, you know, the audience is like, okay, this is actually a little different from that. But I want to shift gears a little bit because we've been talking about like kind of like branding, how you guys are very strong in the branding department from fantasy footballers to the spitballers. But being in the fantasy industry, you know, you still have to be good at analyzing. Otherwise, no one is going to follow you. You can be as funny as you want, but you're not going to be a great fantasy football podcast. You guys have, you know, not only talked the talk, but you've walked the walk as well. You guys have been consistently ranked over the last couple of years in terms of like the Fantasy Pros expert rankings for both like draft and season. I think you have a couple back to back uh, like top 10 finishes for both of them. So talk to me about how important that is, I guess, for your brand. Do you think it's important or because the, the way you guys kind of came into the industry, I don't think a lot of people really put you guys on the map and on the playing field as like serious analysts until you show that you were serious analysts. You know what I mean? And, yeah. uh, and I kind of asked this question to Andy too. And he was like, yeah, I think um, there was a little bit of like a chip on the shoulder until you had to prove it. So is that something that you were like, yeah, we finally like got into the top 10 or you were like, oh, I'm going to do my thing anyways. I don't care where I end up ranking. So it, it, it's kind of, it's kind of both in the sense that when we first started out, we were so happy that we did not build our brand upon the rankings, right? There are some companies that like, they're built because they're supposed to be the most accurate. And, and and if they get beat this season, then it's like, oh, people leave. We're, we're built on our analysis and our personalities and, and all that. However, it became so important. So your, your, your real question here of is it important? Yes, it's monumentally important because we're funny, because we're mainstream. If we like we do a lot of data behind the scenes. If you looked at all the Google Docs and spreadsheets and all the things that we've got mapped out to help all the algorithms and, and everything we do behind the scenes, I think most people that listen to the show would be really blown away that we do that much data-driven work because we don't bring that up. On the show, we don't dive as deep as we do off the show, and that's on purpose. We want to make our podcast consumable. We want to make it fun. But because we make it fun and consumable, people assume we don't know what we're talking about. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, you, those guys yeah. are funny. You, you know, they can... We get this all the time, right? Like a, a Reddit thread will pop up every couple months. What podcast do you listen to? People name podcasts and the fantasy footballers comes up. And then people will inevitably – this this is like you could just copy-paste everyone that's ever going to come. People will be like, oh, those guys are great. They're hilarious. But I think they're more for entertainment. You know, if you want good whatever, go here. And then a slew of comments will come. Uh, they were – they had two in the top ten in draft season. They had two yeah. in the top ten in <laughs> rankings. Like, And that's that really gives us – it also allows us, if I'm being honest, it allows us to be funnier. When we started, I worried that people wouldn't take us serious if we were having too much fun and having an enjoyable podcast that they would think we don't know what we're talking about. Now that that's kind of the, the ace in the hole so that you, you go, look, we can have fun. You can have fun listening to the show and trust us that we know what we're talking about because we've got the, the accolades, the awards, the top finishes in the industry that, that prove that we are putting in the work behind the scenes. We do watch film. We watch all the games. We, you know, we, we grind over here so that we can have fun on the show. And when we started the show, that was 
the whole thing that we built our, you know, you talk about what's your niche, what's your voice, what's your, why did, why will people listen to you? We built our thing, our podcast on three pillars, and we talk about it all the time. We wanted a high production audio quality, we wanted to be entertaining, and we wanted to be accurate. Because we felt like at the time we came in, you could get like at best two of the three. Like you could find some fun, entertaining shows, but if you listened to them, you were going to lose your fantasy league. Or you could find shows that, man, they dive deep in the numbers. They've got great stuff. You're going to fall asleep while you listen, and it's like a chore to listen, but they know what they're talking about. We wanted to have both where you can have fun and, and win. I'd imagine there was a lot of people that were uh, that were kind of mad that you guys ended up ranking so highly because they probably looked at you within the industry. They were like, yeah, there's no way. you know, They're winning because of the entertainment value, but they don't know what they're talking about or whatever. But at the end of the day, it's like, you're right, these companies sell themselves on their rankings and their algorithms and their analytics in, a, in an industry where, like, that stuff's great, but it's so unpredictable to the point where you almost have to ask yourself, what is the most valuable thing when I'm spending my time consuming content, right? I almost think that, like, if, if brands and companies don't start shifting towards more uh, of your model where you offer more than just information and analytics that aren't anywhere near proven because it is such an expanding and, and crazy game that you can never predict, a lot of places will kind of fall off. So you guys are like the first people to really do that successfully and kind of like branch off and make that its own like niche in itself. I think we'll see a lot of shows and podcasts or whatever really take that mindset and develop it on their own. Another thing I kind of see you expanding into, I, I saw your tweet the other day, you were asking people what their favorite DFS tools were. Like, how can you help them in that range? Now you guys, as we've been talking about for 30 minutes already, are very like community driven. And most of your analysis focuses on like season long stuff. Obviously DFS is huge and it's a huge market. And if you're in fantasy football, then you should be in there and you already have the audience. So if you just you know, flip the switch and say, hey, we're going to do DFS, boom, that, that opens the floodgates for you guys to monetize and, and do all these different things. So like, what was your intention behind um, getting more into DFS? I know you guys did a little bit, you have been doing a little bit into it, but it sounds like you want to really expand into that. Yeah, so the last couple of years, we've offered a, a DFS pass similar to the Ultimate Draft Kit, but mm -hmm. it goes through the season. We've got some great writers that, you know, do weekly articles, their, their picks, their plays, um, we've got you know a weekly podcast on the DFS show, but we but you're right we're we are 98 percent focused on season long and on redraft, and the reason we are focused there is not because it's just community is is because we're in Arizona, we don't play DFS like the three of us oh, okay. can't play, so we're not active players. When I ask people, <clears throat> people ask us all the time for DFS content. They want. Like, we've got a large audience and people play, and so they're like, hey, we want more DFS. The problem is I can't, of my own, come up with the perfect DFS solution for you because I'm not an active player. So I crowdsource and I ask the people, what do you find most successful? Because we're partnering with a couple other great DFS experts, not just people but companies that are proven to win because we want to help the Foot Clan win everywhere we don't want you to win your season long and then lose all your winnings you know losing dfs um so yeah we we want to always just we're an iterative company that you know we constantly are just stacking another brick on whatever we're doing so whether it was you know when we started with behringer b1 microphones and slowly went to the b2s and then replaced them with the road broadcasters one microphone at a time we're always just trying to if we keep improving something a little bit step by step brick by brick then you look back and you go wow we've 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 built this castle even though all we did was just put one brick down at a time and so our dfs product as i see it now it was good people liked it but we don't have any tools we don't have any lineup generators we don't have the things that that really help take players who are serious about it to the next level because it hasn't been our focus so hopefully in 2019 we can come out with some things that that help the foot clan win on dfs even more yeah, that's the tricky part about DFS. Again, it kind of goes back to how you're talking about like people go so in depth on um, or companies base their, you know, their success on these rankings and how well they end up ranking in the fantasy pros expert rankings. And it kind of, kind of seems to me like DFS is almost the same thing where, you know, the very, 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 very top level players 
who are experts in it can win and can win money consistently. But that's like anything in life, right? The best of the best are going to win a lot. And 99% of the people fall into the middle who aren't going to win. So when I think of DFS and like, I kind of share that with my audience. I was like, oh, are you going to put out DFS content? I'm like, that's not really what I enjoy. So at the end of the day, I don't think I want to put that out. Even, you know, it, it might be a bad mindset, even if they want it. I'm like, eh, it's not really, you know, it's not really for me. It's not really what I want to push to you guys because I don't play DFS as much. So I kind of just thought it was interesting since you guys, you know, don't harp on that in terms of your analysis that you guys were kind of getting more, more into it. No, I love your mindset. You've got the right mindset. You, If you're not passionate about it, if it's not something that you focus on in your life, then what business do you have saying it? You know, if people are at... So for us, when I say we're not focused on it, Ben Cummins and Chris Meany, two of the best experts in that platform, those are the guys... Like, you come to the... If you listen to the Fantasy Footballers DFS show, that's not me, Mike, and Andy. Right. We don't... We don't... We're not on the show. It's Ben Cummins and Chris Meany next year... There's going to be an even uh, better addition to, to that group. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's one of those things where the, the Bookland wants it and we want to be there for them, but it's not going to be us doing it. Because if we did it, if we said, hey, here's my expert analysis, they'd lose. <laughs> I, I don't want them, you know, I know we know football, we know fantasy, but there's so many layers to DFS that I'm not inherently an expert at from experience that I trust other experts more than myself in that field yeah and i mean that speaks to your audience as well and the loyalty that you've built up with them that they're like we want you guys to do dfs and kind of whatever you throw out in front of them obviously the people that you're getting in front of them are experts and your your audience just kind of trusts that you will you know put the best out in front of them and you know speaking on something that i guess you guys took advantage of in terms of like DFS when people listen to your show you guys have a ton of sponsorships you have a lot of advertisers that want to work with you right wide selection wide variety a lot of them are very very big names as well as we're diving into more of like the business side of things I'm interested to hear about this as well as you know my channel is kind of starting to grow a little bit more and I will be looking to work with more uh, advertisers on on my end I, I kind of wanted to hear like your thoughts on working with advertisers whether you're gonna sign on with one or you know they just reach out to you via email like what's that process looked like from your guys side? do you sit down and like what are the most important things to think about yeah it's changed drastically over time so when we started out we were we were the advertising team you know we had to go and find advertisers that wanted to sponsor our some of our first advertisers so like one of our biggest first sponsors was Handsome Fancy Beard Oil, if you listen, uh, you know, several yeah. years ago. Handsome Fancy Beard Oil is Mike <laughs> the Fantasy Hitman Wright making beard oil in his kitchen and putting a label on it that was his and selling it. He made dozens of dollars from our advertising. <laughs> um, you know, it, so it, it escalated from there to us actually finding someone. I mean, I, one of our biggest sponsors now, Pristine Auction, they're our studio sponsor. They're, they're, they are our largest sponsor of all time. That started from someone posting a signed Gronk jersey on Twitter. Be like, this is awesome. Mike won a jersey at auction. Yeah, I think it was a David Johnson signed jersey. Found out, oh, they're local. He went to pick up the jersey and just started talking to them and say, hey, we've got this product. Our audience wow. would love this, you know, and, and so just started that conversation. Then you then you run an ad, then you run another, it succeeds, and you make a package with them, and you go, okay, what if we give you this many? And, and it grows from there. And so in the beginning, it took a lot of hustle, a lot of work, a lot of keeping our eyes open for advertisers um, that we think we could actually help, not just we think would pay, but like, oh, we could we could sell that product. Our audience would love this. Because if our audience loves it and we love it, then that company's going to make money and they're going to keep giving us money. And so that's how it started. Eventually, you grow to the size where, um, you know, I, as we grew, some people contacted us. Oh, hey, you know, we we help, you know, these people make money and monetize their their channels. And yeah. <laughs> most of those most of those companies that are reaching out to you, I'm not a giant fan of and, and then you know i'm i'm not uh, uh i'm not the expert of experts in that field but i feel like you know it's the ones that you kind of have to go and solicit and get turned down on we worked with a company we work with a company called midroll and when we had a thousand downloads an episode we reached out oh we were, we were crushing it 
and we're like, hey, Mineral, uh, we'd like to work with you guys. And they're like, they were very kind and said, you're way too small. <laughs> talk to us, <laughs> talk to us later. And then so we got 4,000 downloads an episode. And then we, we, oh, we've quadrupled in size. And they're like, no, 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 like you're way too small. Like, the, you know, they come back and they're like, talk to us when, you know, send us an email when you've got 10,000. And then we, we waited until we had 15,000. And then we contacted, but it was like, it's we had to grow to the size where we could solicit the good advertising firms and then we work with them and and um yeah because the foot clan is so actionable uh our our platform is great for advertisers and and we've got a lot of people that want to advertise on the show and, and we actually turn down a lot of advertisers i mean a lot of advertisers there's there's companies we just won't advertise on the show because we either don't believe in the product or it doesn't fit the brand or we don't think the book plan will like it. That's so, so important that like people need to understand. It needs to be a two-way street, first of all. You have to provide value for the advertiser and the advertiser has to provide value for, for you. And I'm kind of in that beginning stage, you know, how you had mentioned in the beginning where like you, you're kind of in that weird zone where you're getting traction, but probably not enough where advertisers, you're not on their map yet. So that's interesting to hear from your end because I do get like random, you know, companies will reach out to me, but for the most part, it's like stupid offers where they'll give you like $3 or $5 for every purchase that someone makes through your thing. And I'm like, that's not worth me trying to sell my audience on that stuff. So I, I wasn't sure if like when you're starting off, you know, you just push content, 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 content until you're so big to the point where advertisers can't ignore you or you do your own research till you find, you know, the guys that you really want to work with and then like, you know, hit that hammer and try to sign on with them, I guess. Yeah, that's that's the approach I would take. And as some affiliate deals can work, but for the most mm. part, e even when we were starting out, we didn't do, we never made any significant money on affiliate deals where it's like we get a percentage of, uh, of the product, you know, the, the audible type, uh, type of reads. Yeah. Cause that's, it just, it's so salesy. Cause the only way that you're making anything from that is by pitching to your audience rather than like these sponsorships that are way more like partner oriented and you guys both feel like you're a good fit for each other. So, um, that was interesting. Thank you for your, your insight on that. And I'll probably, you know, take that away with me and I'm, I'm gonna start writing down names and shooting out emails and be like, this is what, uh, this is what Jason told me. So yeah, there you go. in the email, um, so I also, you know, we're, we're talking about all these different things that you guys are kind of getting into, whether it's the branding with spitballers and, and DFS. Something else I noticed that I see some of you guys tweeting out is like your, your Instagram pictures, right? So it would be like a caption with the link to the Instagram, but without the picture. So people obviously have to click on that to go to your Instagram. Now, most people, 99.9% .9 of people wouldn't really think anything of this, but I'm like a nerd in the sense, and I'm like, oh, it seems like they are doing this very intentionally because you all seem to have started it like around the same time. And I know you probably haven't done it personally as much as like Andy or I have seen, you know, it, it pop up on Twitter kind of often. So I wanted to hear like, was was this something you guys like sat down? We're like, we're going to make this a New Year's resolution. We want to build our personal images and our personal brand on, on Instagram because that's a huge platform that um, if you're not, you know, utilizing right now, now, then then you're probably missing out on something so the stage is yours i want to hear something about yes. that yes your your keen eye has noticed it was it was intentional that's that's you know a tip i would say to anybody starting out you want to you want to make a podcast like take it as a business you, you know i if it's your passion like fantasy football was our passion but we always took this as a business so yeah we sat down we're intentional about look we need to grow our instagram we we ignored instagram our entire existence i mean Last year, this 2018 season, the fantasy footballers handle, we finally started actually doing work on Instagram. Our personal handles didn't exist. We just didn't care. We're so busy on Twitter. But we feel like Twitter has grown to the point now where if we don't push Twitter, it'll continue to grow. It'll continue to snowball. Um, you know, we get growth when the accounts are uh, the size that they are. And the younger generation, <clears throat> the younger generation is on Instagram more and more. And so we wanted to be intentional about, look, we need a presence over there. Um, we've never really given it much thought and we know we can we can grow it pretty quickly. And so, yeah, I mean, I look, Instagram's hard for me, I'll be honest, because <laughs> I feel so vain, because everything's a photo. Like, yeah. I can tweet out, I can talk about things left and right, but like, getting that, getting that phone out and snapping pictures of myself left, right, and center, or snapping pictures of what I'm doing, it just like I I have not overcome. Maybe I'm getting to the to the old age where it's like 
I'm an old curmudgeon. But Mike, <laughs> Mike, I mean, this is made for him. He's like living with his phone out. Every time, it was so funny, at the iHeart Awards shows, <laughs> we go, uh, Damon uh, is, we've got a manager named Damon. He was with us there. And um, as Andy and myself and Damon are starting to leave, they're kind of ushering people out of the building. Damon's like, oh, hey, should we go on the stage, try to get a picture with the sign? And we look over to the stage. And lo and behold, Mike is already up there just doing the wildest, crazy rock star <laughs> pose with his own selfie. It's like, no, Mike's taking care of this for us. So I'm sure his Instagram will grow far more. They are. We want to use that as like a behind the scenes, as more of a personal get to know us account um, and grow that versus just football content. Football content will be more on Twitter. But yes, you are correct. It was intentional. It's a focus. And in 2019, I think we'll, we'll become the largest uh, – instagram as far as the the fantasy footballers handle yeah i think so too and that was something i noticed i was like this previous year instagram had um had always been like my favorite social platform just from a personal standpoint and i was like this is where everybody is so i made um you know a brand instagram account for fantasy football where i only tweet out fantasy stuff and it grows so quickly on that platform so it's, it's obviously somewhere you need to be and you are definitely correct in your feeling of like being uneasy on instagram because 95 percent of the things that people post on there are very um how do i put it? like cringeworthy and i'm like oh god i never want to grow my audience by doing the things that these people are doing like it's very it, it, uncomfortable so i mean i could totally see where you're coming from it's not just an age thing i get the same feelings when i see a lot of people doing stuff on there but like you said it's it's a very big personal thing and with you guys people really want that behind the scenes so i don't even think you need to think about or like be be intentional with those instagram posts like legit like you just being in the studio if after this video you just literally like whipped out your phone and took a selfie of you sitting in your chair in the studio people would love that stuff like those are the kind of things you should be putting on instagram um well here we'll, we'll do it right now yeah right now, i'll get a, I'll get a <laughs> picture i'll put this up on instagram later Let's it's me it. talking on the big doggies talking on the big doggies talking on the big doggies if i can figure out how to work a phone Woo. all right amazing we'll put that up later it'll be like my sixth post Hell yeah. Let's go. I got in the top 10. Yeah, I thought there was something intentional in there. That's that's pretty funny that you guys all kind of started at the same time doing that. Now, moving into 2019, this is something that's new. What else can we expect from the fantasy footballers? Or is it uh, a lot of the same? Just a lot of good, consistent content? What do we, uh, what do we got in store? So we have a lot of things in store behind the scenes that we're always working on. Like I said, we're always iterating on our product. I would say the biggest change outside of the spitballers, uh, hopefully being more of a part of, uh, of our brand, is probably going to be some of the web content and web uh, and mobile device tools and applications. Um, we have for many years, so we had a background, I, I think Andy walked you through, um, I used to run a company that did uh, mobile games, Facebook games, those type of things. And we had a team of world-class programmers and developers, and we know how to do all of that. So I know how to – I don't know how to code. Uh, my life would be a lot better if I did. Um, but we know how to organize that and, and develop that content. But we've never had someone that we could actually work with in the studio. And this last year, at the end of the last year, we actually brought on a full-time programmer. Mm, uh, who okay. was used to work with us at Broken Bowl Game Studios. So he is incredible. A lot of the tools and resources that we have wanted for years from the get-go, like why doesn't this thing exist? Why doesn't this chart exist? Why doesn't, you know, all of these things, we're going to have those start coming out this season. We'll have an Ultimate Draft Kit app. You know, we've always made it mobile friendly, mm -hmm. but like we haven't been able to develop our own app, but we'll have an app this year. We'll probably do something more with a Fantasy Footballers app as well and have tools and resources on the website that help you win that you can't find anywhere else. So that's the biggest change I see coming in 2019. Okay. Yeah, I was going to ask you, are you going to make an app for the draft kit? Because it seems like that would be super helpful, and I feel like people would love that. I always thought like apps were, it's a good idea, but it's it's hard to develop an app when you don't have an audience that's big enough. You know, like it's weird to develop an app when you don't have uh, enough people kind of coming to it. You're like, why would you even put your time into doing it? Um, so it's it's pretty cool that you guys are going to start kind of delving into that. Now you were the at that Facebook Games company. You you started that, correct? Uh, kind of, yeah. Me and another partner, we started that company. It started originally as like a MySpace layouts. 
if you remember MySpace, you were probably four years old. No, no, and no, no, no. <laughs> I, I was roaming around MySpace, man. That was all me. There you go. Well, you probably were on our website back in the day. We were on about one in every five MySpace pages. But when MySpace died, we pivoted over to Facebook and gaming and, and all of that. And so the Facebook, that's when uh, when we were gaming, that's when like we hired Mike because he's a, an incredible musician. He has a degree in like video game music. And so we brought him on to do all of our audio. And uh, But yeah, so I, I was... Yeah, we we pivoted to there and made it as a team. But yeah, I I was one of the two owners. Okay. Now being one of the three owners of the fantasy footballers, what would you say are pros and cons between, I guess the differences between running these two different companies? Like what are the things you enjoyed about one or didn't enjoy about the other? Things like that. Like what lessons did you take over? Look, uh, I used to think I had one of the best jobs in the world when I ran that company, and now I realize how Wrong. far away I yeah. was because now it is so much better. And I would say the biggest differences are what we used to develop uh, back in Facebook days. A lot of times we'd be making games that were really, really popular with 14-year-old girls, and you know those the, that was our demographic. But we weren't playing these games. They weren't games that like I loved and I was passionate about. And then there was kind of a rift between me and the other owner. We did not always see eye to eye. That ended up being the, the downfall. And so coming over to this business where we're working on what we love, we're working on our actual true passion. We love fantasy football. That's what we're we, – our audience is us. We're, we're just making stuff for ourselves, and people like it. So that's an improvement. And then me, Mike, and Andy, look, we are genuinely close friends we are in sync on worldviews and on how to run a business. You know, we don't want to take over the world and build the biggest empire possible. We could be we could be much larger than we are right now if we wanted to just make that the focus. But we're family first. Uh, we are security and 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 um, you know we we don't put uh, the risk for more and more and more ahead of being able to make sure we make every child's band performance and and um you know can we're building this business so we can be better dads yeah i think that's such an important like takeaway from this and people need to realize that how you said you know you could be way bigger if you wanted to and it's almost even like hard to believe because you guys are getting to the point where you're you know you're, you're very big at least in my eyes because maybe i've you know I, i'm familiar with the industry people having self-awareness is such a, a big it's such a big deal that i don't think enough people realize that like understand what you want when you're setting out to do something and understand your core like values and understand what's actually important to you because then you could start running your business based around what those values are. Because if you don't want to be the biggest company or make the most money, you're going to sacrifice the money, but you're going to be able to gain in a lot of, a lot of other aspects of your life. So I think when you're starting off, like everyone out there listening, like personally needs to, needs to understand that and needs to be self-aware about what they personally, uh, what they personally want there. Um, and yeah, I if you don't if you don't set your values first, like you said, like you just recommended, if you don't have those values established, then as business grows, business will take you other places that right. you would not have been in the beginning. So you, uh, I agree with what you're saying. You have to establish those in our in our break room in our kitchen. We have a big printed poster board size sign of what our values are and the the core principles that we filter every business decision through. That's up there, and we've also got a sign in the office where we work, Andy, Mike, and myself, that just says, remember how you, remember why you do this, remember how you got here. And it's, you know, we don't want to be anything but what we are. I think, uh, I think those signs are primo Instagram material right there. <laughs> <laughs> That's post seven and eight right there. There you go. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll post them out. I'm sure people would be interested in them and see what, see what our values are but maybe i'll i'll get the permission from andy and mike i mean i i'm proud of them i know andy and mike are proud of them we uh we take it serious and we really do filter every business decision through those principles yeah because like you said it could take you down a million different paths if you don't know where you're trying to get so that's super important and uh just circling back to instagram i meant to ask this before now you guys are, are very good at you know diversifying where you put your content and you know trying to figure out where the audience is. 
do you see any platforms right now? Obviously, you guys are just starting to get into Instagram for both personal and the brand. Are there any other platforms that you guys kind of see on the the up and up or that you're going to experiment with? Or, you know, how do you uh, how do you see that right now? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that there's one specific place that I see and I go, that's it. But what but you are you are asking the right question, because what we talk about all the time, like, you know, we have conversations with different radio terrestrial radio channels like do you want to can we syndicate can we do this uh, television uh, companies like do we want to have a show do we not things like that but we are focused on new media we don't want to be the newspaper mm -hmm. uh, you know we want to be the mobile phone so i think new media is huge whether that's going to be instagram tv and that you know th that actually grows more and more or whether it is um, something that doesn't exist yet, but I think it's going to be more mobile, more stream and download based than, um, you know, than anything else. And, and that, you know, that's not so much social media, um, as it is media media from us. Uh, I think the platforms to put them are going to be online platforms versus big networks. Yeah. I think anything that you could pretty much find on your phone is going to be where the new, thing i guess if you want to say and that's super important again too if you're starting something because in the beginning whatever you're doing whether it's a product or service the only people that are really going to be watching or listening to are like your friends and your family once you get outside of that like close circle you need to expand where there aren't so many faces and names and it's not so saturated so it's like you always have to be thinking in today's world in today's like marketing world you always have to be thinking like what could be the next thing that blows up because you might have no following on twitter or podcasts or youtube which are the bigger media platforms when it comes to fantasy football but if you get in early on whatever the next thing is right a lot of people that are ogs on on twitter might not agree with you but it doesn't matter if you blow up on that platform because you now have your audience and you now can deliver your message whatever that message is uh, is going to be so it's like even for you younger demographics i actually think they probably have the advantage because this thing is just like sewn into their life at this point and they know exactly what platforms are kind of blowing up and um what things are getting popular so it's like always 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 be looking out for what, what's on the up and coming and when you are diversifying it's so important to do it natively like to that platform you see a lot of people just kind of like taking one thing and putting that exact thing in 17 different places and it's not you know that what works on youtube is not going to work on twitter and, and vice versa you know what i mean so it has to be very personal to whatever media platform that you're you're putting it into yeah we're, we're really lucky we we all have uh, three kids about the same ages and we're all we're all dealing <laughs> with about 10 year olds right now as as the oldest kids so in a couple of years you know four years down the line when it's like okay where are we going? I'll just ask my kids. I'll be like, hey, what's the, what's the new social media platform? And they'll know a lot better than I will. Yeah, you sit them down and interrogate them. I like that. Yeah. I, I ask my little cousins that too. I, I, I vlog a lot on my channel, just like my behind the scenes stuff. And I'll put up long videos of that stuff. And I called them vlogs for a long time. And my cousin, who's like 15 now, would get mad at me. And she's always texting me, stop calling them vlogs. They're vlogs or whatever. She'd always go nuts about them. So it was kind of funny. Uh, it's funny, the, the younger generation with that stuff. That's uh, most of the questions I had for you and most of the topics that I wanted to, to dive into. And I like to leave the listeners with some kind of actionable advice from my guest, whether that be just a tactic or you know a piece of hardware or software or some motivation. Jason, take us away, my man. Sure, I would say the most important thing when you are starting anything, uh, if it's a business or just a hobby, podcast any kind of media is you have to and this will sound so cliche and so <laughs> redundant but you have to be yourself uh you have to know who you are and not change not it's really hard it's it's so hard when you flip on a microphone to not do another voice or to not try to be what you think people want to hear or see because i can promise you most people don't think that other people want to see them. You know what I mean? Like most people aren't just so full of themselves that they think, man, the world just needs me. But you know what? That is what they need. They need who you are. When Andy and Mike started this podcast, they started it without me. And it was only for our league. It was for 12 other people. That's it. It was just making fun of our league, talking about our league's trades and all that. 
And then they and then they were like, well, and it was the best podcast I've ever heard. They were so funny. They gave us so much crap. It was awesome. And then they're like, well, if we're doing this, let's just let's turn this outward. We feel like we know a lot about fantasy football. Let's let's make this for other people. And so then they started the fantasy footballers. It was the worst show I'd ever heard for about three episodes <laughs> because they turned into different people. Yeah. They 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 you know tied the ties tight and button that top button and it was like and they were so professional and i was like what where's the fun show that you guys were rocking like that show was perfect just do that and then as soon as they changed i knew that there was something special there and it was it was going to be big and so i hitched a wagon <laughs> well at least you uh you caught on early man you got in so we can't call you can't call you a bandwagoner i guess yeah, that's so that's so 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 important. Those are honestly my favorite comments on my YouTube channel when people are like, "Yeah, I really appreciate your, you know, your genuine like personality. You can tell that this is like authentic." And I feel like even if I'm not, you know, even if I miss on like 80% of my fantasy picks, people will always gravitate towards me for authenticity. And it's because so many people aren't authentic. And that's the thing, like, yeah. that's really where you can differentiate yourself. It's like, at, at, soon enough, we'll see that authenticity will be like a normal thing. But it's only like, it, it feels like people needed to be told that that's how they should be, right? And now we're kind of coming around to, you know, this stage in media where authenticity is winning. So now people are finally like shifting, shifting that way. So that's, that is definitely so important when you are starting out, because that's also something that makes you unique. You want to say you want to talk about separating yourself, like, what better way to separate yourself than literally just be yourself because no one can do that besides you. Be yourself, people. Don't try to be cool. Don't do drugs. Stay in school. That's going to wrap up this interview with Jason Moore of the Fantasy Footballers. Jason, thank you uh, so much for coming on to the show. This was an awesome episode. I had a great time talking to you. Your Twitter is already, that's been floating around your uh, your nipple area, so they'll know where to find you. If you have anything <laughs> else, <laughs> yeah, if you have anything else that you want to... Uh, plug in here um, where they could find spitballers podcast or whatever you can let them know yeah I, I appreciate it thanks for having me on yeah you can check out our website at the fantasy footballers.com the spitballers at spitballerspod.com and uh, follow just follow our social media and you'll you'll be taken for a ride in 2019 all right well you heard the man and i will see y'all on the next episode adios <laughs>